Welcome to the 84th Henry George Daily Devotional. We are in Chapter 3, The Proposition Tried by the Canons of Taxation. I do not think uh, ideas of which I can I speak can be entertained by the reader who I saw. Yeah, yeah, he's like, you, uh, you can't really buy the ideas I've already been. T- I've just been saying, so we have to really discuss it. We are in Book Eight, Application of the Remedy. George writes, the best tax by which public revenues can be raised is evidently that which will closest conform to the co- following conditions. One, that it bear as lightly as possible upon production so as least to check the increase of the general front fund from which taxes must be paid and the community maintained. That it be easily and cheaply collected and fall as directly as may be upon the ultimate payers so as to take from the people as little as possible in addition to what it yields the government. 3. That it can that it be certain, so as to give the least opportunity for tyranny or corruption on the part of officials, and the least temptation to law-breaking and evasion on the part of the taxpayers. 4. That it bear equally, so as to give no citizen an advantage or put at a disadvantage as compared with others. Let us consider what form of taxation best accords with these conditions, whatever it be, that evidently, that evidently will be the best mode in which the public revenues can be raised. One. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, so this is chapter three with five sub-chapters. One, two, three, four, five, oh, four sub-chapters. I don't think we'll make it through all of them. All right, all right, here we go. The effect of taxes upon production. All taxes must evidently come from the produce of land and labor, since there is no other source of wealth than, than the union of human exertion with the material and forces of nature. But the manner in which... Equal amounts of taxation may be imposed may very differently affect the production of wealth. Taxation which lessens the reward of the producer necessarily lessens the incentive to production. Taxation which is, this is reminding me, I'm here to talk about this last time, Hauser's Law. It's just the empirical observation that in the United States, federal tax revenues since World War II have always been approximately equal to 19.5% of GDP, regardless of wide fluctuations in the marginal tax rate. So that's why some people argue the most important thing is simply growing GDP, and then whatever tax you do, you'll get 20% of it. But there is, well, that is what some people argue. There are things you could respond. Um, Taxation which lessens the reward of the producer necessarily lessens the incentive to production. Taxation which is conditioned upon the act of production or the use of any of the three factors of production necessarily discourages production. Thus, taxation which diminishes the earnings of the laborer or the returns of the capitalist tends to render the one less industrious and intelligent, the other less disposed to save and invest. Taxation, which falls upon the processes of production, interposes an artificial obstacle to the creation of wealth. Taxation, which falls upon labor as it is exerted. Oh, I'm sorry, all these yawns, where are they, where are they coming from? Uh, wealth as it is used as ca- taxation that falls on labor, income tax. Wealth as it is used as capital. It's not quite a capital gains tax, but 
Land as it is cultivated will manifestly tend to discourage production much more powerfully than taxation to the same amount levied upon laborers. Whether they pay, whether they work or play, hmm, hmm, okay, um, that first tax, taxation that falls upon labor as it is exerted versus uh, the same levied upon laborers, whether they work or play, ah, a kind of tax that's levied regardless, not because they work or play, okay. Um, yeah. The taxation to the same amount levied upon workers, whether they work or play, upon wealth, whether used productively or unproductively, or upon land, whether cultivated or left waste. Yes, okay, I'm with you. The mode of taxation is, in fact, quite as important as the amount. As a small burden badly placed may distress a horse that could carry with ease a much larger one properly adjusted. So a people may be impoverished and their power of producing wealth destroyed by taxation. Yes. How much weight can you carry in a good backpack versus if you had to carry it with your pinky finger? I don't know. Uh, and so a people may be impoverished and their power of producing wealth destroyed by taxation, which, if levied in another way, could be borne with ease. A tax on date trees imposed by Muhammad Ali caused the Egyptian felas to cut down their trees, but a tax of twice the amount imposed on the land produced no such result. The tax of 10% on all sales imposed by the Duke of Alva in the Netherlands would, had it been maintained, have all but stopped exchange while, ex while yielding but little revenue. Uh, what is a what a uh, is there a federal sales tax? Um, California, we have uh, the combined is seven percent. This is the total. California is six percent. And then with, I guess, federal is like 1.75%. We're not far from that. But we need not go abroad for illustrations. And yet we do still have a lot of trade. So, hmm. But we need not go abroad for illustrations. The production of wealth in the United States is largely lessened by taxation, which bears upon its processes. Shipbuilding in which we excelled has been all but destroyed. So far as the foreign trade is concerned, and many branches of production and exchange seriously crippled by taxes which divert industry from more to less productive forms. This checking of production is in greater or less degree characteristic of most of the taxes by which the revenues of modern government are raised. All taxes upon manufactures, all taxes upon commerce, all taxes upon capital, all taxes upon improvements are of this kind. Their tendency is the same as that of Muhammad Ali's tax on date trees, though their effect may not be so clearly seen. All right, well, show us these effects. All such taxes have a tendency to reduce the production of wealth and should therefore never be resorted to when it is possible to raise money by taxes which do not check production. Yeah, all this seems pretty straightforward to me. Doesn't need much commentary. Um, this becomes possible as society develops and wealth accumulates. Taxes which fall upon ostentation would simply turn into the public treasury what otherwise would be wasted in vain. Show for the sake of show. And taxes upon wills and devices of the rich would probably have little effect in checking the desire for accumulation which, after it has got hold of a man, becomes a blind passion.
not sure what's so bad about his this uh, if he's saying um, taxes upon ostentation you know like a yacht tax it would simply turn to the public treasury what otherwise would be wasted in vain show for the sake of show I mean that's he's, that's a complaint I don't know and tax upon wills and the rich would probably have little effect in checking the desire for accumulation. Um, yeah, that's a point I don't make much when I'm talking about um, like if if that's if there's a way for somebody to hoard a bunch of wealth to the detriment of others, uh, they probably are going to do that as much as they can in their life if they want to do that whether or not they can pass it on I suppose I don't know but the great class of taxes from which revenue may be derived without interference with production or taxes upon monopolies for the profit of monopoly is in itself a tax levied upon production yeah, like the power of a monopoly is sort of generally thought to be in proportion to how much it retards production in that uh, area of industry, in that industry. And to tax it is to simply divert into the public coffers what production must in any event pay. There are among us various sorts of monopolies. For instance, there are the temporary monopolies created by the patent and copyright laws. There has been there has been a like 500 message discussion on the Discord, George's George's on Discord in the last 24 hours about patents and copyright. Uh, these it would seem. These it would be extremely unjust and unwise to tax, inasmuch as they are but recognitions of the right of labor to its intangible productions and constitute a reward held out to invention and authorship. Now, I think, is this the footnote where he goes back on patents? Following the habit of confounding the exclusive right granted by a patent and, and that granted by a copyright as recognitions of the right of labor to its intangible productions, I and this fell into error, which I subsequently acknowledged and corrected in the Standard of June 23. The Standard is the George's newspaper that Henry George ran for several years uh, in 1888. The two things are not alike, but essentially different. The copyright is not a right to the exclusive use of a fact, an idea, or a combination, which by the natural law of property all are free to use, but only to the labor expended in the thing itself. It does not prevent anyone from using for himself the facts, the knowledge, the laws, or combinations for a similar production, but only from using the identical form of the particular book or other production, the actual labor which has, in short, been expended in producing it. It rests, therefore, upon the natural moral right of each one to enjoy the products of his own exertion and involves no interference with the similar right of anyone else to do likewise. Um, yeah, he's arguing that patent and, uh, hold on, there's someone at the door. Okay. Um. Yes, this is where he says he approves of copyright, but patents he does not approve of. The patent, on the other hand, prohibits anyone from doing a similar thing, uh, and it involves, usually for a specified time, an interference with the equal liberty on which the right of ownership rests. Copyright is therefore in accordance with the moral law. It gives to the man who has expended the intangible labor required to write a particular book or paint a picture 
security against the copying of that identical thing. The patent is in defiance of the defiance of this natural right. It prohibits others from doing what has been already attempted. Everyone has a moral right to think what I think or to perceive what I perceive or to do what I do, no matter whether he gets the hint from me or independently of me. Discovery can give no right of ownership, for whatever is discovered must have been already here to be discovered. If a man make a wheelbarrow or a book or a picture, he has a moral right to that particular wheelbarrow or book or picture, but no right to ask that others be prevented from making similar things. Such a prohibition, though given for the purpose of stimulating discovery and invention, really in the long run operates as a check upon them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like I'm sold on the on the patent argument. The funny thing is when I start feeling that maybe copyright should also uh, be abolished. So here's the raw argument for the copyright is that, you know, you should get the reward of your creation. Um, but you do. Um, like if you write a book, you have that book. You paint a painting, you have that painting. Uh, it's a question of copying. Um, and if you give me... Some digital good are like, I mean, I don't know, you make a video game, you can play it, you give me that video game, I mean, you probably just make a copy of it and give me that copy anyway, like that's how digital transfer works these days it's not all just on a, a disc and I can still play my video game and the more you copy my game it doesn't affect that at all hmm. yeah the principal argument is uh, is a weird one and then for a long time I was very persuaded of the sort of empirical argument which is like or not even empirical the other argument which is like um, we need to we need to incentivize innovation and we also don't want people who innovate to keep those things secret from the rest of society. So, though, like, the uh, inspire innovation argument is not very persuasive to me anymore but it is definitely just sort of an intuitive thing and uh, it's hard to think of lots of examples where people didn't innovate because they're like hey I mean we've had the patent system for so long but I, don't know, I just tend to think that we were sort of on an exponential curve of tech and humans generally are on progress or of technological progress and I guess I remember here a friend was describing he says you know um, where did he list uh, 
GPS, lasers, the internet, semiconductors, materials, research, COVID vaccines. Uh, those were all um, I guess from government research maybe he's saying or academics or non uh, patent. Anyway those are patents not copyright anyway. All right, back to George. So in the original text, he uh, he said copy. He said all IP is okay, but then he said no, no, no. Patents bad. Copyrights okay. Then he continues. He says there are also the onerous monopolies alluded to in Chapter Four of Book Three, uh, which result from the aggregation of capital and businesses which are of the nature of monopolies. But while it would be extremely difficult, if not altogether impossible, to levy taxes by general law so that they would fall exclusively on the returns of such monopoly and not become taxes on production or exchange, it is much better that these monopolies should be abolished. In large part, they spring from legislative commission or omission, as, for instance, the ultimate reason that San Francisco merchants are compelled to pay more for goods sent direct in New York from New York to San Francisco by the Isthmus route than it costs to ship them from New York to Liverpool or Southampton and thence to San Francisco is to be found in the protective laws which make it so costly to build American steamers and which forbid foreign steamers to carry goods between American ports. The reason that residents of Nevada are compelled to pay as much freight from the east as though their goods were carried to San Francisco and back again is that the authority which prevents extortion on the part of a hack driver is not exercised in respect to a railroad company. And it may be said generally that businesses which are in their nature monopolies are properly part of the functions of the state and should be assumed by the state. There is the same reason why government should carry telegraphic messages as that it should carry letters. The railroads should belong to the public as that common roads should. Yeah, sometimes I, I wonder about... what is the principle of what should be government role <sighs> excuse me versus the market and the idea of these natural monopolies like technically the justification for common roads i recall reading it was uh was sort of this is circular with it, which is, oh, we have a national um, letter, letter delivery system. So because a postman is a public employee, uh, that way we will assume the burden of building all the roads and the whole uh, system, uh, network of roads. But now, currently, snail mail is uh, its not clear that we even need it. I mean, and uh, look at, you know, I mean, I guess UPS, FedEx, they can only function because of the, the roads be, that have been created. I don't know. Some libertarians do talk about what well, what would the world look like with the privatization of roads. It's weird. Um, all right, we didn't even finish section one, but I'm gonna end it there. See ya.